Okay, everyone, I know we've got a lot to get through today. So in the interest of time, I will make a start um, and um, take on the role of introducing today's session. Um, my name is Brett Blacker and I'm proudly the CEO of English Australia. And uh, it's my pleasure to be able to do the opening for today's uh, presentations and, and welcome you to the Action Research in Alicos Colloquium. Um, this colloquium, if you're joining today, has been run over the past um, three days. So this is the third day of the event. Uh, we normally hold it as part of the English Australia Conference, but due to the virtual format, we've been able to run it as a, a single event and bring it to you in its own showcase. Um, today, we'll have some of the teachers who have been involved in the program, uh, the 2020 English Australia Action Research um, Program, to be able to deliver their and present their research projects. Um, I'd firstly like to thank Cambridge in Assessment English, who's been our proud partner of this program uh, for 11 years now, and we certainly wouldn't be able to conduct it without their support. Um, they've had real impact in the Alicos sector here in Australia through this commitment, and we certainly thank them for that ongoing support. Um, they're in role, involved not only within the Action Research um, Program, but uh, a wonderful partner and supporter of English Australia generally. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge and thank Professor Ann Burns, who once again has led the program and provide fantastic mentoring support to all of the, the researchers that uh, undertook this 2020 program. Um, and again, her, her support and commitment to researchers across Australia um, is undoubtedly um, unwavering and, uh, and we thank her for that commitment. Um, the interest in taking part in, in the program has always been strong, but we will be calling for expressions of interest again about mid-November. Um, so you can find out more about the program and um, how to join either by uh, reviewing some of that information uh, on our website. And you can see the link here we have available. Um, that is also available uh, on our website and um, or please feel free to contact um, our professional development manager, um, Sophie O'Keefe, if you do have any questions. Um, I'm really excited to say that today we are launching our new special interest group, the Action Research um, Special Interest Group. And so it's the first time we've been able to establish a community of practice um, for ELICOS professionals that are dedicated at looking um, in terms of action research um, within the sector. Um, we now have a, a wonderful group of mentors um, and previous participants in the action research program who we know will provide incredibly valuable support to others across the English language community here in Australia um, in terms of how you can build action research programs uh, within your own um, centres. Um, but again, I encourage you to look at the, uh, the Action Research Program if you're a first time uh, to doing it and, um, and equally pleased to join our new special interest group. Um, all of our other special interest groups are really well subscribed and provide very active networks to, to share information. So uh, we hope through this, we can support um, individuals and institutions to take part in, in Action Research Program. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Enrico Cavallo, he, Cavalli, who's an Alicos teacher at the University of Newcastle, Sydney campus. And he's going to present his first um, um, research project for you today. Um, so without further ado, I'll now um, hand over to Enrico. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, good afternoon. So yes, as Brad said, my name's Enrico Cavaroli. Uh, I'm a, an English teacher here at uh, the University of Newcastle, Sydney campus. And my action research project was focused on video versus written feedback on writing. Okay. So uh, the, the teaching context here at the Language Centre in Sydney is, uh, we, it's a direct entry pathway. Uh, so students are going directly into their, uh, in this case, postgraduates. Uh, studies. So there we have an English for general purposes uh, course, and we have elementary, intermediate, and upper intermediate levels. And we have English for academic purposes. And each level is about 200 hours over 10 weeks. Okay, so I had two cycles. Um, the first cycle happened before 
the lockdown and before the travel ban uh, on, on China. So in the first cycle, there were uh, seven students. It was an EAP class, so it was face-to-face, -face, relatively homogenous student group. So they, were all, they all had the same country of origin. They were all from China, same first language, and they were all future postgraduate business faculty students. So either doing accounting or an MBA or something like that. Okay, cycle two though, uh, this is when the travel ban was introduced in February. Um, that was an online class. There were 12 students and it was an upper intermediate class. Uh, at, but again, it was a relatively homogenous group because of course it was Chinese students. Okay, so um, I started giving video feedback towards the end of 2019 um, after we had an in-house PD session um, Someone here went to the English Australia conference and saw uh, the presentation by Neil Richards from QUT. Uh, it, it was called Closing the Feedback Loop. And uh, yeah, that was a part of it was about giving video feedback. Uh, so one thing, when I surveyed the students informally at the end of that course in uh, that class in 2019, almost all the students liked, uh, preferred the video feedback. Um, one student preferred the written feedback, um, they liked the, the ease of access, you know, being able to quickly review it before an assessment. Um, and that's one thing I thought about, like maybe scrubbing back and forth in a video uh, was a bit time consuming, not as convenient. Um, sometimes I saw students listening to it on their phone rather than watching it and being able to see what I was talking about. So I wondered whether students were actually using it effectively as well. Um, so, my two questions when I was doing this research was, do students actually prefer video feedback to written feedback on their writing? Why uh, are students more able to incorporate video feedback than written feedback to improve their writing? Okay. All right, so uh, the, the research background. So I was looking at, uh, a lot of this comes from Neil Richards' presentation, common teacher complaints about written corrective feedback. So some people were saying, oh, it distracts from other important aspects of writing, in particular content. Uh, students tend to focus on grades instead of understanding the feedback. Um, students may find it difficult to interpret feedback. Um, and there's some related issues here. Students might not be ready to notice particular errors, may not understand why something is wrong, not taught how to revise their writing um, or use error correction. So they, they they might be given these error correction codes, but they might still not be sure how to use that to improve. And yeah, there might be a complaint that error correction leads to small improvements in the quality of writing. So why? Okay. So one reason might be, or several reasons might be to do with student affect. So students may feel confronted by or disappointed with feedback. So this may lead to feelings of you know, they, they want to reject the feedback or they have a loss of motivation. High levels of student dissatisfaction with feedback are related to things like it being inconsistent, unhelpful, infrequent, or badly timed. Okay, but then why, so I've talked about perceived problems with written feedback. Why is it important to you? Why would you want to use video feedback? Well, it gives you time to elaborate more. It's more personal, less social distance between the mark and the student. Tone of voice makes it easier for the student to accept feedback. Teacher is more likely to highlight the positives. Uh, from the teacher's perspective, may uh, we might find that we spend less time on feedback. I, I say at higher levels here because I have spoken to other teachers who feel that they can go through uh, and correct by hand a piece of writing faster than it would take them, uh, especially at the beginning where I was taking handwritten essays, scanning them, and then giving feedback that way. Uh, but, of course, uh, this year, a lot of things have been moved online, including the way that students write. So, uh, not so much of an issue anymore. Okay, and even though teachers might feel like we're spending less time, from the student's perspective, uh, they, they think that we've spent more time. Okay, so there were two cycles, two classes. So, the first one, uh, so this was the face-to-face -face class. There were three in-class handwritten writing assessments. And at the AP level here, we have, we do a cause and effect essay, problem solution and argument essay that are assessed. 
And there are two in-class handwritten practice essays beforehand. So that uh, before each of those, so in total, that would be nine essays that receive teacher feedback. Okay, so the way I did it, I promise solution, essays received written corrective feedback, cause and effect received video, and the argument essay received written corrective feedback again. Okay, for upper intermediate, this is where we were uh, moved online and the typical assessment schedule changed. Uh, so yeah, it, it altered to accommodate the Sunshift online studies. Students were writing them in Word doc or through the Blackboard LMS. Uh, they were not, uh, for the ones that were written for homework, they were not invigilated anymore. Uh, so in this case, there were two cause and effect essays and three uh, advantage disadvantage essays. So the first, first essays of each type received video feedback. The remaining essays received written feedback. Now, this might seem like at the beginning of the year, this seemed somewhat innovative, but I think after the year we've been through, uh, teachers have been using all sorts of tools. Um, so this seems almost quaint in, in retrospect, but uh, it's still, still some interesting information came out of it for me. So, trying to move to the next slide. Okay, so here's some example. Uh, here's some examples of written feedback. So in cycle one, uh, yeah, I was just writing on their page uh, that they had submitted. Cycle two, often submitted in a Word document, and then I would add comments in the margin. Let's give you a moment to look at that. Okay, and then uh, here's an example of video feedback. This is for the face-to-face -face class. I'll just play it shortly. Uh, the sound here is quite quiet. So you might want to turn up your volume as high as you can to be able to hear it. It was recorded in a, in a room with not the best audio, but we'll try it. Okay, maybe that audio is not gonna work. That's okay. It's just to give you an idea of how I gave uh, feedback through the video. Let's continue on. Okay. So for the data collection, um, yeah, for the, for the student questionnaire, there was a Likert scale, they were open end, and there were also open-ended questions. It was anonymous uh, and it was designed to measure relative satisfaction with the two types of feedback. So here's some examples. Okay, so obviously on the left, this is from the face-to-face -face class. On the right, we've got the uh, online class. So, there it says, describe what you like about the feedback on your writing. I can also practice my listening. Okay, that's one of the benefits that uh, you're not just using one skill, but several. Uh, I like face-to-face -face teaching. I have strong feelings to participate in it. So this is uh, related to the effective factors. So um, yeah, the, the student it closes that social distance with the teacher. Uh, teacher will teach some grammar, not just one sentence. Okay. So describe what you dislike about video feedback. So sometimes the video is not clear, there's a problem with focusing. So Panopto, Zoom, um, they will, the resolution will change depending on the, the student's internet connection. So that was a factor at the beginning, especially uh, before we introduced a university VPN. Um, and, you know, but before the, the, they were easing the restrictions on uh, Chinese students accessing using the internet for study. So describe what you, uh, so the terrible internet makes this sort of open. Okay, so same point. Okay, so for the error tally, so here I was recording how many errors the students were making at what type, um, measuring whether the written feedback or video feedback was more effective in reducing repetition of errors in subsequent essays. So I divided into these, error categories, so grammatical accuracy, which tended to be 
morphology, things that uh, errors did that did not affect too much of the rest of the sentence. Um, then we have cohesion and coherence, so signal words, um, you know, links within paragraphs and between paragraphs. Academic writing, so academic register, are they they're writing like a university student? Syntax, so these were errors that might have affected the whole sentence, might have required a rewrite. Uh, vocabulary and natural language, uh, logic and quality of argument. So one of the things I wanted, I was hoping with video feedback is that uh, because of the format, I would be more inclined to give more uh, feedback on logic and quality of argument, because uh, that was something that was mentioned in the literature, and I want to see if that happened for me. Okay, so the video feedback was popular among both the face-to-face -face and offshore class, so 100% of students agreed it was more personal, long enough to know what to revise, language was easy to understand, positive aspects were praised, positive attitude uh, to the video feedback, and that they'd like to continue receiving it. 83% said they preferred video feedback to written feedback, the remainder were neutral. 25% found the video, uh, watching video feedback time consuming. Okay, so uh, comparing the essay error tallies with the preceding essay. So you can see here that for the written corrective feedback, uh, it actually, there were more cases where the number of errors increased in the subsequent essay. For the video feedback, you can see, uh, yeah, that 57%, there were fewer errors. Now, if we break it down though, in the face-to-face -face classes, you can see that uh, the written feedback actually ended up having fewer errors. Okay, so that was a difference. But then once we include the online, okay. So once we include the online, you can see um, for the, the written corrective feedback, it didn't work too well. So two thirds, the number of errors, uh, two thirds of the essays, the number of errors increased. Uh, and for the, the video feedback was the opposite. Okay, so for, if we're looking at the change in the number of errors compared to the average number of errors that were made, so essays where the errors decrease, they decrease by about 30%, uh, where the increase increased by about 35. Uh, video feedback, okay, similar numbers also when we break it up into the face-to-face -face and online. Uh, the only difference was that for the online where the errors decreased, uh, yeah, it only decreased by 21% uh, for the for the written feedback. So not as effective as it had been for the face-to-face -face class. Okay, also the online classes punctuation error average was more than double the face-to-face -face classes average. So this is probably intuitive. You probably realize that um, if you're using a word processor, it tells you what sort of errors you're making even within Blackboard LMS. Um, but when with punctuation, uh, especially the students who are used to using Chinese uh, word processing programs, often there's a space already included in the font for commas and full stops. So th this, is this really related to English language ability or is it more like um, just getting used to word processing in English? and proofreading. Okay, so yes, the spelling error average was less than a fifth of the face-to-face -face average, so obviously much less once they moved online. Okay, so the positive questionnaire results for video feedback may be due to the novelty, it may, may wear off. Um, so I, I can't say anything conclusive about that. So there does appear to be a small advantage of video feedback over written feedback for online classes in terms of students avoiding similar errors in subsequent essays. For the longitudinal study, does the appeal of video feedback persist and are there effects on student performance beyond the 10 week cycle? That would be something that uh, would be interesting to look into in the future. Um, also looking at the teacher as a variable. So I only, there was only me giving feedback. It would be good to compare me to other teachers doing the same thing. And also whether it affected uh, the teacher, uh, the teacher's propensity to give positive feedback. So compared to, um, and I didn't find anything really in terms of me giving more feedback on logic and quality of argument. So that didn't increase really with video feedback. Um, but yeah, it'd be good to, to measure positive statements as well from the teacher. Okay, 
So thank you. We've arrived at the end. So uh, if there's any questions. Thanks, Enrico. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophie, and I'm the Professional Development Manager at English Australia. If you have any questions for Enrico, please do put them into the Q&A section. Enrico, it was, um, you provided some really strong arguments for using video feedback, um, especially that 83% of students who prefer it. Um, and it was actually really fascinating to hear what students think of it across a range of areas, you know, with their listening and um, the affect. So thank you for that. So we have Phil here who has a question. Have you considered peer feedback using video? Oh, so uh, in that sense, getting students to give feedback on each other's work? Yeah, I guess with video, via video. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Uh, no, I haven't considered it, but that, that sounds fascinating. Maybe you could tell me more about it. Yeah, yeah it does sound like a great idea. Um, someone's just asking if they can get a link to the audio samples. Um, and yeah, I think... I, I mean, uh, I can forward those files and maybe, maybe they can be made available somehow. Yeah, I can pop them up with your slides afterwards. Paul would like to know if it took you longer to provide video feedback and share it with students. Uh, yeah, for me, it took much less, um, much less time. Um, it might depend, like, I think for very experienced uh, teachers, they're used to providing written feedback, so they're probably very fast at it. Uh, for me, it's always something that I felt too long for me. So that's why I was looking for alternatives like video feedback. And for me, giving uh, video feedback on each essay, it averaged, you know, it could be from five to 15 minutes, basically. So, if, you know, if there, were, there was hardly anything wrong with it, yeah, it would be five minutes. Uh, for more complicated cases, maybe 15 minutes at the, the, the most extreme end. Um, but that was still better than providing written feedback on the EAP essays in this context. Mm. I think you mentioned before that for lower levels, that wasn't the case. Yeah, well, other teachers felt that way. Um, I've, I've used it for upper intermediate as well, and I felt it was okay. But for example, at elementary, if you're just getting students to write a paragraph, mm. uh, yeah, it does seem like a lot of work to be providing video feedback on a paragraph that it's probably taking you time to set that up. Mm. Whereas you could just sit down and make it do error correction on a paragraph very quickly, I think. Yeah. especially for the type of errors that are being made at lower level. It's not something that you would need to think deeply about. Yeah, absolutely. There's not that sort of logic and coherence element to a small paragraph. Um, Claire has a question. She's asking if there's a mechanism for students to collect their errors to help make a checklist or something similar for when they're editing next time. To, to provide them with the error tally, you mean? Um, I guess she, she'd like to know if you use a checklist um, or if students are provided with a checklist so that they can refer back to that when they're um, self-editing next time. Yeah, that is something we've looked at and I'm, I'm sure many universities have talked about it in PD sessions. I didn't use it in combination with this, but I don't see why it couldn't be used mm, that way. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you're just doubling up on the process then though. That was, I mean, part of the appeal for me was also saving time. Um, if, when you're adding more steps though, I mean, if it's a, Benefits to the student, yeah, that sounds mm. great. Yeah, I guess they could use the checklist themselves, you know, if it was just a template. Yeah. Sylvia's asking if video feedback can be used for in-person classes as well. Um, yeah, well, so in the face-to-face -face class that I did, I would provide them the video feedback um, and then uh, the, before I was giving video feedback, I often found I gave written feedback and then I'd be talking about it in class anyway mm -hmm. uh, with them to make sure that they understood. Um, with the video feedback, there seemed to be less of a need for that because uh, it, it kind of replaced um, replaced that. I mean, the downside is it's not as dialogic, but um, yeah, if students didn't understand something, they, they did. There were instances where they 